Hello, welcome back. I'm on another video jag today. And uh, I'd like to get a couple done. Um, I can't remember what I did last time. But um, I've got a few books here. And I wanted to attempt to give you an impression. I'm not going to spend too long a time on this one. But I wanted to give you a good impression. A rounded impression hopefully. Of uh, Ezra Pound's speeches. Um, the reason I'm, I could do a lot of videos on Ed, Ezra Pound as a poet because there's lots to say about him. But I thought I'd start off with this since it's the most controversial aspect of Pound's legacy as it were. And uh, yeah, I thought I'd just dig in with this first investigation. Um, I've got a few books here. As I mentioned in another video, uh, when I was in Korea, I lived in Korea for quite a while. And I went through a spate of just printing out books from print shops quite cheaply. And this is a bunch of, um, a, another bunch of books. Um, not all of these are terribly controversial. Um, I do have, I've all just, I've just labeled them by hand, as you can see. Jefferson and or Mussolini. That is a controversial text and nobody who studies pound in a university will touch that with a barge pole I would imagine uh, it's not something I'm going to get too into today uh, although I will mention it um, because it does relate to the speeches uh, the other two I've got here that are self printouts are Antile and the Treatise on Harmony which is Pound's writing on music and also the Gaudio Breschka book you can actually get that uh, without having to print it it's pretty easily available I think but anyway, that's by the by. Um, they were just in the lump of books with the speeches. Um, now, one interesting thing about this side of Pound is that um, since the internet's really got, gotten a lot of steam uh, in terms of various information, um, I've been watching this quite closely over the last decade. And there's actually a lot more information about this side of Pound than there was with all kinds of commentary or perhaps people just uh, wanting to relate what Pound said. Um, this text was published in the 70s. We don't actually have, uh, if you go to Penn Sound, the site I've already mentioned before, I think there is one example of recorded sound of Pound's speeches and it's very crackly and it's almost useless if you want to know what he was talking about. Well, what we do have are the transcripts and Pound made notes for every speech that he gave. And so between those two, this volume managed to eke its way into the publishing world. I don't imagine it's it's currently in print. I will put that in the notes to the video if I know of any official uh, publications on this topic. What I will do is I'm going to read the introduction to the transcripts anyway, just to give you an introduction to them. Um, like I say, there's been a lot more investigation into Pound's... Let's just say the side of Pound that the boomers won't really consider. Um, I think they're worth considering, not for his um, views on race particularly. And I've said this in other videos... Um, just to get a grip on what was his view of the war and what was his view of economics. That will be seen through lots of uh, slurs against the Jews. So you navigate that however you want. And the interesting stuff about, um, about this new information, the way that it's being propagated on the internet, is that um, a lot of it is very neutral on, on the topic of race they're either just um, putting out people reading parts of the speeches and, and this won't be much different so I don't want to spend too long on it because if the information's already out there there's no point in me making a video but I did want to give like a decent summary from a personal perspective on uh, why these speeches are important to me and what is the general gist of them um, again like Jefferson and or Mussolini 
uh, you're not going to get this discussed in the academy in any detailed way to my knowledge now there might be some open-minded people out there who are willing to actually take sections of the transcripts and and present them to people um, of course the problem with this side of it is that because the boomers won't touch it and and the subsequent generations aren't willing to really investigate it um, immediately on opening the transcripts you're presumed to be some kind of anti-semitic war um, hate monger or whatever um, all I can say is I don't perceive myself to be like that uh, but I am interested in the speeches because they give you a very interesting um, take on, on Pound's politics of the time and uh, I'm not going to say it's horribly conspiratorial and universities just deride this side of Pound what I will say is they will I guess they they have to to some degree given that Pound lived in a time, a given cultural and social time, they will have to summarize uh, this, these views in some way, usually just to give context. But I guess my point would be is that they won't look at this stuff in depth and uh, actually analyze it in depth. And I'm going to try to to do that. And most of it will be Pound's own words, so you won't get a lot of my viewpoint on it. Uh, but I will kind of comment where I feel it's necessary. I'm trying to find the publish, pu publishing history of this book. I printed it out quite a while ago. Um, and I've already said to you that it's coming out in the 70s. I think it came out in 78 or 79. For whatever reason, in my copy, my printed copy, I don't see any publishing details at the front of this book. So it's just a straight print printing of the list of speeches and then the speeches themselves with a forward and an introduction uh, I do remember the, the fellow's name who who collated and edited the collection he's a very brave person for that time I would imagine his name is Leonard Doob um, So let's read them. I, I just want you to get a handle on um, Pound's thinking. I mean, Pound already in my in my research and in my reading, we know that through the twenties and the thirties, Pound is getting much and more, much much more interested in economics. Okay, so that's a lot of the reason why he um, he wants to give these speeches, and he's already figured out in some generalistic way I would say even as early as the late 20s or possibly even earlier that war is a racket I mean he had to figure out as somebody as many people of his generation did he, he was trying to figure out why the first world war occurred um, and so that would be on his mind and of course you go back to the poems of that time you know Hugh Selwyn Mobley is the big one it's, it's all about um, you know, taking a critical stance on the circumstances of the First World War. Um, and so that, as we go through the 20s and into the 30s, this becomes the prominent side of Pound, and he is in combat with the British publishers, the contacts he's made in Britain, and even in France, and he's really um, isolating himself to a degree because he's researching something. He's being led down a certain path of research, and certain people don't like it. I don't think T.S. Eliot was very comfortable with it. He wrote a book called After Strange Gods, uh, where Eliot himself seems uh, at least mildly anti-Semitic in that. So uh, you would have to do a lot more research on the back and forth between particular poets and authors in the 20s to to try to get a handle on what, what Pound's position was in relation to other writers. Obviously, by the 40s, it's, uh, it's wartime, tensions are high, people perhaps no longer want to have anything to do with Pound. Some of his economic pamphlets are being published, and very few people are reading them. They almost do not resurface after the war, so that affects the, the knowledge that people have about Pound. Um, as we go into the late 40s and 50s obviously Pound is um, in St Elizabeth's at that time again I'm not going to give a lot of 
biographical detail on Pound apart from the general knowledge that, that anybody would know if they studied Pound a little while, which is that Pound gave the speeches, was uh, arrested for treason against his own country, um, pled guilty on grounds of insanity and was kept in St. Elizabeth's in Washington for around 15 years uh, post-war. Okay, so let's get into the forward and the introduction. The best reason for publishing Ezra Pound's Italian broadcasts may be the simplest. Thousands of people have heard about them, scores have been affected by them, yet but a handful has ever heard or read them. Here they are. There are other compelling reasons, the first having to do with the magnitude of their author. No other American, and only a few individuals throughout the world, has left such a strong mark on so many aspects of the 20th century. From poetry to economics, from theatre to philosophy, from politics to ped pedagogy, from Provençal to Chinese. If Pound was not always totally accepted, at least he was unavoidably there. Those traits of mind and character that made Pound so inescapable are not only evident in the broadcast, but also present in ways that make them more fully understandable. Here is that same fearless plunge toward the heart of the matter, often heedless of consistencies, that marked his study of ancient and exotic languages and cultures. Here is that same urge to simplify and instruct that, that marked his unorthodox textbooks, the ABC of economics, ABC of reading, and the rest. Here is that flair for dramatic hyperbole which peppered the cantos and produced such deliberately shocking titles as Jefferson and or Mussolini. The broadcasts do not always show these traits at their best, but their blatant presence makes them useful clues in putting together the puzzle of that powerful enigma at their centre. Even if the shadow of Ezra Pound did not so broadly colour this century, these broadcasts might still command a clinical respect for the way in which they interrelate so vitally with the rise of fascism in Europe and the accompanying extremes of feeling with the cause and conduct of World War II, as viewed from this special place by this very special commentator. To the historians who have counted this an almost anti-ideological war, the broad casts offer considerable counterpoint. Furthermore, they are the starting point for understanding two major cultural events of the post-war years, the trial of Ezra Pound and the literary prize controversies. The Bollington Prize debate, by itself the politico-literary cause celeb of the generation, while once totally preoccupying, has to this day refused to lie at rest. Even this young Greenwood Press series, begun 25 years after the fact, offers two fresh and extensive treatments of the issue. Such insistent unrest shows clearly the need for this essential evidence now at hand. Um, if you don't know, Pound won the Bollingen Prize. At some point after the war, I can't remember, it could have been the early 50s maybe the late 40s, and uh, that caused a lot of furore because by this point he had um, a reputation for being a treasonous character in the US. The broadcasts do not show Pound at his best. War, bigotry and totalitarianism are not sunny subjects, yet giant figures need their full dimensions, and unpleasant subjects can and should be studied for the best of reasons. How indeed are we to lessen our chances for future encounters with shrinking horizons if we do not learn from episodes so recent, so strongly cast, and so richly charted? We applaud then the respect for a complete historic record which has allowed the pound literary trustees to overcome an understandable reluctance towards seeing these scripts in print. We applaud this same impulse which has motivated the patience and stamina of Leonard Doob there are, and there will always be, more motives behind an act like this than one can chronicle. From our point of view, however, this work provides a singular and extensive collection of data for the pursuit of that most bewildering of cultural equations. The balance between the creative force, the individual personality, and the social context. Seen in this light, Ezra Pound's texts 
become a contribution in American studies at a profound and essential level. And that's Robert H. Walker giving a forward to this to these transcripts in 1975. So this is only two years after Pound's death. Um, how far do I want to get into the introduction? It's fairly short. Um, I'll, I'll give snippets possibly and then comment on them. So this is Leonard Dube's introduction. The title of this book is the signature Ezra Pound, almost always used at the start and sometimes at the end of each broadcast from Radio Rome in World War II. Pound himself had proposed to publish 300 radio speeches containing also the texts of his money pamphlets, newspaper articles published in Italian and his translations from the Chinese, Ta Ho, the, the Great Digest, and Chung Yung, the Unwobbling Pivot. Incidentally, I, I kind of like those those translations that Pound did. I'm less enamored of, the, of, the, of some of the other ones. Pound started to write for radio toward the end of 1940. The first scripts to be accepted were read in English by regular speakers of Radio Rome. In January 1941, he was able to record his own speeches, which were broadcast on an average twice a week. He wrote the text at his home in Rapallo and on occasion in Rome, where he travelled to record on discs a batch of 10 to 20 speeches. He wanted the disc to be transmitted in a particular order, but it is apparent from the discrepancies between his numbering system and the dates on which the Federal Communications Commission recorded the speeches that the Italian officials did not always follow his plan, although in general the deviation was not great. He gathered news and information from Italian newspapers and whatever foreign papers he managed to obtain. From Italian broadcasts and any foreign station, especially the BBC, he could hear on his own radio, from conversations with friends, officials and travellers, from letters of friends in America and other countries, and from his own library which included back numbers of periodicals. He envied the BBC's supply of news and feature materials since he himself had not one disc. He says that in July 25th, 43. After the fascist government fell in July 1943, Pound left Rome and eventually submitted scripts and ideas to Mussolini's Republic of Salo. No evidence exists to indicate that any of the material was ever broadcast to America in Pound's name from Radio Milan, while that station remained under the regime's control. The present collection consists of original manuscripts Pound prepared to read on Rome Radio, divided into two parts. Part 1 includes all of the available manuscripts for the broadcasts recorded by the FCC, October the 2nd, 1941 to December the 7th, 1941, January the 29th, 1942 to July 26th, 1942, February 18th, 1943 to July 25th, 1943. These are the speeches that have been quoted by Pound's critics, and they include those selected, selected by American authorities who sought to press the charge of treason against him. Okay, I'm going to skip a little bit. There are egregious errors and omissions in these FCC transcripts because recording equipment in those days was crude, because atmospheric conditions interfered with the monitoring, and because I assume the transcribers sometimes did not recognize Pound's references. The FCC versions of Pound's speeches hitherto available, therefore, sometimes give a wrong impression. Poundians and others have noted that the French novelist Céline was transcribed as Stalin. Other mistakes can be observed in many instances, probably resulting from the vagaries of shortwave. One illustration, Pound's sentence, even Lenin saw that the easiest way to deport, debauch the capitalist system is to debauch its currency. Became, yet even Seven saw that the easiest way to divorce the capitalist system is to divorce its currency. To date, however, it has been impossible to locate five of Pound's original manuscripts. Hence, the FCC versions in these instances, imperfect though they are, have been substituted in this volume. In a few instances, gaps in the manuscripts themselves have been filled by sections of the FCC transcripts. 
these substitutions are clearly indicated. By the way, I'm obviously going to try to find an online link for, for this volume that I'm reading from. I actually forgot to give you the title. Obviously, the subject is Pound's Rome speeches, but the title of the book is called Ezra Pound Speaking. If I didn't mention that, I should do. Part 2 includes 10 speeches written before the FCC monitoring unit had been established, some read by Pound and some read by others, as well as speeches either not used or not monitored. They have been selected by Mary Dirac-Wiltz's because, sorry, they have been selected by Mary Dirac-Wiltz because in her opinion they represent a fair sample of Pound's central ideas and themes. The anonymous and pseudonymous scripts Pound also wrote are not included in this book because they merely repeat ideas already expressed in other speeches. Okay. I'm going to skip a little bit more. Hopefully you will have access to this text then. Anyone who seeks to understand Pound or to write about him and his times cannot overlook these speeches. Although Pound's reputation will forever rest on his poetry <coughs> and other writings and not upon these scripts, the broadcasts are part of his record. Actually, the speeches should be of interest to Poundians not only because, according to Mary de Racker-Wiltz, they reflect his earlier writings, but also because they affect his subsequent poetry. <clears throat> Why have I personally undertaken this editorial role? Admittedly, I am not a Poundian in any sense, and I have read and understood very little of his poetry. I offer three reasons. First, Mary de Racker-Wiltz asked me originally to work with her in preparing a definitive edition because she thought my knowledge of propaganda and World War II would be helpful. During that war, I was actively engaged in psychological warfare against Italy, Germany and Japan. I remember vaguely seeing some of the FCC transcripts of Pound's speeches at the time and dismissing them as irrelevant to my own work. Then, secondly, I have been interested to see whether the technique of content analysis which was useful to me during World War II and later in analysing Goebbels' diaries would be helpful in comprehending this vast collection of words. The analysis of the 110 speeches the reader will note in appendices <coughs> is pitched on a modest level and simply seeks to answer a straightforward question. In how many of the broadcasts did Pound make one or more references to particular themes, persons and countries? Finally, although I must add that my own attitudes and feelings have not been one bit changed after working with these speeches, it has been interesting to come to comprehend what Pound was trying to accomplish. His attack on the profits some men reap from wars reminded me of my own experience during the summer of 1934, when I was employed by the Senate Committee then investigating the merchants of death. I'm assuming he's, he's referring to quote from Pound there. My own conscience is at peace on a mundane level. Compensation to my research assistants has exhausted, nay exceeded the funds allocated to me personally in my role as one of the Pound literary trustees. <clears throat> my share of the royalties from this book will not go to me. I am grateful to the trustees of Pound's estate for giving Mary de Racker-Wiltz and me access to the original manuscripts. Okay, and then I think much of that is just thanks to people who have helped produce the volume. So how am I going to approach this? I'm pretty much just going to approach it as I was originally reading the transcripts, which means I sit down with a pencil and I underline things that interest me. And of course, given that I've, I'm videoing this, I can give extra commentary if I need to. <clears throat> so, it's going to be scattered. The speeches have a scattered quality anyway, so it won't make much of a difference. But I'll just comment on some of the things I have underlined and uh, read out, read them out. Uh, this is the first one, Last Ditch of Democracy. It's a ditch, all right. Democracy has been licked in France. The frogs were chucked into war against the will of the people. Democracy has been licked to a frazzle in England, where it never did get a look in anyhow. 
but even pseudo-democracy breaks down when a people is chucked into war against its will, and the Brits never voted Winston into the Premiership. In fact, when did they have an election? I guess I am going to give my perspective on this, but I'm not much of a Churchill fan, so... Um, it's inevitable that I comment um, in my own way ideologically. The other thing to notice is that what makes some of the speeches impenetrable to us is that there's lots of, as, of, as with nowadays, there's lots of names of people, cultural commentators, politicians, etc., that no longer interest the American or indeed the British public. So um, I can't give context for all of the names, but he's essentially attacking people within the media and within government uh, who are manipulating the culture. Any one of 86 Jew millionaires can start a publishing firm and any one of the 4,000 hired troops in the British Embassy can print all the crap he likes. And see, immediately he's equating um, millionairedom and control of, um, control of American government policy with, you know, he's making the connection with the Jews. Um, and I would only go so far as to say, yes, they are Jews, and uh, yes, they are millionaires, and yes, they are controlling um, the population to a degree in terms of putting out their opinions and manipulating the minds of the public. Uh, my only caveat is is that you know there's, there's lots of benign Jews, and this is the problem with the reading of the speeches, is that, is that as long as we conflate Jew millionaires controlling the media and the populace as all Jews, that would that's the issue, right? That's where we go wrong when we read the speeches. Um, anyway, pound is is atten pounds attention is sprawling around from country to country. It's, it's very interesting because he's got a very wide angle, so he's looking at all the different countries and how they're responding to the war. A lot of China is not pro Kai Chek. A lot of China is not for that gang of foreign investors. Then, of course, you might rescue the de Gaulle interests. Namely, you might go die in the glorious cause of the Bank of the Paris Union against General Pétain, the victor of Verdun. So he's looking at recent French history. Books and music, speech two. Mr. Churchill. Even Mr. Churchill haven't, hasn't had the brass to tell the American people why he wants them to die to save what. He is fighting for the gold standard and monopoly, namely the power to starve the whole of mankind and make it pay through the nose before it can eat the fruit of its own labour. So speech three, entitled The Golden Wedding. Three centuries to get people to understand anything about anything having to do with money. And it is now demonstrated on the corpus vilis of British reformers' hopes that very little economic reform gets into practice without precedent organisational and political measures of an almost earth-shaking nature. A curious phrase about reconstruct capitalist society must belong to the translator. I don't want to pin that on Joseph, though maybe that was part of his muddle. I am far less concerned with Joe's lacunae than with a few clear positive statements. Joe said he was aware that a number of capitalist governments are controlled by big banks, notwithstanding the existence of democratic parliaments. So he's making the point there that even, even Stalin, at least to my knowledge, Joe, knows that uh, Russia is controlled by banking interests by whom specifically we're yet to find out but Pound is going to throw some names at us along the way uh, this was always quite an interesting speech I thought number four this is called this war on youth on a generation and I think this is quite powerful because it's he, he's got that consciousness of generation what is going to pass down through the generations as the reasons for the Second World War. So I'm going to go into this a little bit more. A consignment of the unpopular American magazines has reached me. 
I don't mean doctrinal magazines, but magazines in which a serious article occasionally appears. Thus I have learned that Professor I. A. Richards, one of England's few respectable highbrows in America, is lecturing. Yes, naturally, the le lecturing. And apparently the normal effort to keep things going goes on. Wallace Stevens, J.G. Fletcher, old Doc Williams, is referring to William Carlos Williams, and Comrade Cummings, knowing a bit more about writing than the younger men who haven't quite made up their minds whether they want to do a real job of work and learn how. So he's going through different um, bits of information he's getting from America and Europe. Have you read the details of British blackmail on Chile, on the men in Chile who want to trade with the outer world? Details of Rosenstein's freedom of the seas, Navicet, that was what they tried on Italy, and Italy came in on the German side. If Chile don't, that merely means that every man in Chile who is blackmailed into signing those papers will store up a silent hate against everything English and against any nation that participates in such a policy. Starve them out. Will you separate the starvers from the producers, the growers, the makers? Look at Hank Wallace, good guy, nice presence, led down one garden path after another, perfect Hampton Court maze, Lord Fa Halifax. First you asked to reduce production, plough under, then after a few years you are threatened with rationing. Rationing. In, in the United States of America, the land of abundance, the land the Lurb chart showed beyond any possible shadow of doubt whatsoever to be the land of abundance. Every family of four could have had, then, a standard of living equal to what then cost $4,000 a year. Needed monetary reform, of course, had to have honest national money to get it. The United States of America needed internal reform, not a war in Africa or in Asia, not a war for the mine owners against the farmers of Rhodesia, not a war for the opium of Shanghai and Singapore. From internal reform could have come collaboration with the other four continents and freedom of the seas, the kind that will permit Chile and Argentina to trade with France, Spain and Sweden and Switzerland and will let old Hoover tote food into Belgium. Will you look at the age of the chief war pimps? Roosevelt now says he saw war coming in 1937. In 1937 there was no necessity of war. Roosevelt did all he could to make it inevitable. There is no record of any single act of Roosevelt aimed sincerely at staving off war. Ignorance of Europe, government in charge of Hicks, all the outer world thinks Roosevelt took orders from the worst gang in Europe. Don't say I affirm that he did. What I affirm is that he never showed the faintest inclination to learn the facts and come out for a just solution. That is a fairly conservative statement. He has never been neutral. But get down to this one point of age. How old are these blokes who are trying to throw America into the conflict? What is their business? What is their civic record? What is, or ever has been, their desire to let you get the facts? Those of you who want pa to see Paris again will owe it to Pierre Laval, whom the British tried to have murdered. Those of you who ever do see Paris, either for the first time or again, will not owe it to Mr. Churchill. Had that criminal ape got his way, there would have been absolutely no Paris there. The working man does not want to govern. He wants good government. You Americans and the English want government to be good without any effort on your part whatsoever. You don't even look at what is done by your governments takes an awful heave to get any of your attention turned on to the vital facts of a government policy. Most men want certain things in their own lives, largely in or inside the sphere of their own trade or business. Very few analyze that want or carry their thought through into the realization of what they want with a practical system of government. First intellectual reaction to mere approach of industrialization Thoreau tried to see how little he need bother about other humanity. 
amateur move. I'm jumping around a bit here. If you were going to follow the text, you wouldn't necessarily pick up everything that I'm saying in this sequence. So um, the last point there is that um, Pound is very much a, a civic poet, so he's not interested in Thoreau's anarchism, the idea of um, retreating from society. And in fact, that's fairly clear if you look into his appreciation for people like Confucius. Um, you have to be invested in society. In fact, that may be another reason why um, Joyce's ambiguous dream language didn't have any interest for him. As our constitution got well out in front, was for more than a century, in fact, for 130 years, far and away the best on earth, I had Alice thought we could get all the social justice we need by a few sane reforms of money, such as Adams and Lincoln would have thought honest and constitutional. The grafters would rather throw you into a ten years war and kill off five or ten million young men than even let the discussion of monetary reform flower on the front pages of the American papers. We could with honour advocate natural commerce, that is, a commerce wherein each nation would exchange what it has what, what it has in superfluity or abundance with what other nations can or will spare. We could stand for that sort of commerce instead of trying to throttle it. Why do we not? Why should all men under 40 be expected to die or be maimed in support of flagrant injustice, monopoly and a dirty attempt to strangle and starve out 30 nations? For whom? It is not even for the people of England, to whom a ten years war means death by starvation. So we're in 41 here, so the, the war is really ramping up, and of course in opposition, Pound's getting rather pissed off about it. Uh, rightly so, I say. Um, a friend said to me the other day that he was glad I had the politics I have got but that he didn't understand how I, as a North American, United Statesman, could have it. What I am ready to fight against is having ex-European Jews making another piece worse than Versailles and a new two dozen Danzigs, namely the United States being left with war baby bases in Aberdeen, Singapore, Dakar, South Africa and the Indian Ocean all dragging the tail of their coat and making dead mathematically sure of another war for Dupont, Vickers, Mond, Melchet, Bait, Elliman in 10 or 15 years after the present one, present war. And to that end, Roosevelt, Morgenthau, Lehman are working day and night, not to mention the Warburgs. And precisely on the subject of Warburgs, I wish Herb Hoover would say more about the stink of Versailles. He's talking about the Versailles tre Treaty at the after the First World War, is it 21, 22? Um, becomes the European Union, which is the problems that we have now, and then we get the uh, we get uh, the EEC. I think I think Pound would, in my own view, um, would have loathed the notion of, a, of an EEC and a European Union under the auspices of anything related to what came out of Versailles and generally speaking, the European Union. I make those connections, some, some other people don't. Uh, and it's also important here to mention, although he is definitely throwing around uh, anti-Semitic slurs, he is also being very specific about the names. So he's referring to a specific businessman, Jewish businessman, okay? I think that's always worth mentioning. Um, I think actually, uh, he may well have regretted that later on. I've had a discussion with other poets about this, about Pound's regret, um, whether it is an established fact that he did explicitly regret Jew slurs against the Jews or not. I mean, that's always a big topic. I don't know. I can't speak for, for, for Pound, can I? But um, uh, there's evidence via Allen Ginsberg that he, you know, there's that one quote that always comes up. Um, I'm a little bit sceptical because it's not, it's not a third party quoting Ginsburg, uh, quoting Pound with, in Ginsburg's presence. So I don't know if that's 
the view. I mean, if I was pound, I, I guess I would regret that I generalized and that I had just kept with the names, you know. But, you know, uh, these are the mistakes that humans make, I guess. Hardy's England, aye, aye, sir, where is it? Did Rothschild save it? He did not. Did the goldsmith save it? He did not. Does Churchill endeavour to save it? He does not. I repeat, the rot and stink of England and the danger to her empire is inside and has been from the time of Cobbett. <laughs> Cobbett, if you don't know, was a economic reformer of some degree um, during the early 19th century or late 18th um, uh, he, wrote, he wrote a book called Rural Rides as well, a, a kind of cultural travel travelogue as well. An interesting guy, actually. I haven't read enough of him. And no number of rabbis and bank touts in Wall Street and in Washington can do one damn thing for England, save letter alone. And a damn pity they didn't start doing sooner. That is a pity for England. I, I I do agree with lots of statements Pound makes about England because I think England has been totally culturally wiped out since the Second World War, almost totally. Um, so then again, you know that you have to weigh up that cost. Do you risk a, a racial generalisation for getting certain facts out into the public mind? I have before now pointed out that England was cut off from the current of European thought during and by the Na Napoleonic Wars, and that she never got catched up again, not during all the damn nasty in 19th century, always lagging behind. Perhaps she allus was lagging behind. I have pointed out the difference of up-to-dateness between Voltaire and Mr. Samuel Johnson. That's an interesting statement. I mean, I've often thought that, say, English poetry in its Vatic sense has kind of could have ended with William Blake or at least ended partially with the Romantics. It's a possibility. But Pound has definitely put that idea around. The day Hitler went into Russia, England had her chance to pull out. She had her chance to say, let bygones be bygones. If you can stop the Muscovite horror, we will let bygones be bygones. We will try to see at least half of your argument. Instead of which, Hank Wallace comes out, no peace till the world accepts the gold standard. The gold standard in America was taken away by Richard Nixon. 71 or 72. Pound's perspective, it's a bad thing. I'm assuming because he's looking at it from a 19th century perspective. Um... There's rumor. No, there's no, there's more than rumor that that Trump recently has has put put the Federal Reserve back on the gold standard. I haven't looked into it, but I've taken note of it's possibly happening. The late Lord Rothermere, whose culture was nothing, as you might say, to write home about, finally decided that the English public was wholly unteachable. I don't know whether you can learn anything from history. I don't know whether you are even yet in the state of mind where you want to learn anything from history or from any other source whatsoever. No, the United States has, politically and economically speaking, had economic political syphilis for the past 80 years, ever since 1863, and England has had economic syphilis for 240 years. So now she is a molting and dropping. Hong Kong, Singapore, Canada and Australia. Seems like it is tertiary. There's another point that needs to be made. Uh, the Bank of England, the Central Bank of England was created in 1691 or 2, the early 1690s. That's what Pound's referring to there. And I would at least vaguely agree with that. That a central bank of this nature destroys cultures I mean there are some caveats I would want to investigate but that maybe that's for another uh, talk well as Lord Rothermere said they are unteachable I don't know how much more they reckon to drop before they get ready for physic 
I have said on this radio before now that uh, along about 1695 or 94 the Bank of England was put together and in 1750 they shut down on the Pennsylvania colony money and the system of lending paper out to the farmers and in 1776 the natural consequences of that dirty London policy of starving and cheating became, as they say, more apparent. Lincoln saying, gave, this to, gave to this people the greatest blessing they ever had, their own paper to pay their own debt, and then the assassination of Lincoln. And then another 80 years to the end and absolute collapse of the American system of government. Can we revive it? Has the country got the guts for the climb? Is there, as I am saying this, the faintest stirring of a desire inside the United States for any healthy new structure? Or are we the gadarene swine taken with collective hysteria? Are there ten men in America ready calmly to go back over the events of the past few years in America and in England? Is there the faintest stirring of American curiosity as to how a sane government could be built up? Or at any rate, any nucleus or group ready to go back and learn how we were built up from the beginning? Adams, Jefferson and Van Buren to, de to read and digest. You can't talk it over with me because none of you can get to a radio. You can't print stu stuff like this in your papers because the newspapers are not there to inform the people. You have got to talk to each other. You have got to write letters one to another. Pound was a great letter writer. There's volumes and volumes of his letters. Only a few selections available popularly. So that hasn't really changed, has it? This is from Speech 8, The Stage in America. I am chasm the method of war scares. I think this is a misprinting. The method used for getting people worked into hysteria. And part of it is attacking one wrong, appealing to the soft heart, and then, by false dilemma, offering the hearer a bit of sheer bunkum, i.e. offering him an alternative and doing a hat trick to make him think it is the only alternative. False dilemma. You call that in a logic class. Being disgusted, as 98% of all decent men were, with the results of usuriocracy, which is Pound's eccentric term for money lending. Money lenders de-civilization, money lenders ruin of the good life in the Occident, and everywhere else they could get their dirty hooks onto. A lot of us fell for any alternative, jump in the part we didn't look at very closely, never stopping to ask, do we believe Marx and Lenin? Hence, part of the red and pink beano. When their hair begins to loose, lose its adolescent hue, a few men begin to think of a system, a working system, a base and basis for human living together. And the answer comes out the same. A house good enough for the ordinary folk to, to go on living in, from one generation to the fourth and fifth generation. Uh, at this point in the next speech, he reads out Canto 46. Do I want to cross-reference that? Um, I do have my Cantos here somewhere. I'll leave it for now. Maybe I'll come back to that. Oh, it's sorry. It's, it's here, at least in some kind of a section. I won't read it, I'll just stick with my underlinings for now. This challenge is a chance, uh, sorry we're at speech number 10, sale and manufacture of war. This challenge is a chance to, about the sale and manufacture of war. This war is part of a profit. The present phase of that profit began at the end of the 17th century. By 1750, a corrupt and avaricious government in England working for British monopolies, was shutting down on the Pennsylvania colony's issue of money, paper money, money issued against land, work, and the industrious and sane nature of the Pennsylvania colonists. 
I have given between 70 and 100 talks on the radio, and if I come back to the microphone 100 or 200 times more, I could start every talk, talk with that statement. Until you see this war as an incident in a series, you cannot understand it or judge it or qualify yourselves as judges of the rights and wrongs of the present act in the story. This is a really interesting point for me because I, I've always been fascinated by the British 17th century historically. And we have a civil war and it's a really tumultuous century. And I think if you were going to speak politically, then you would say that, that, that any freedom of speech was, was lost at that time. And possibly the founding of America is a response to that, you know, direct response to the problem of actual freedom of speech, freedom of economic survival. And uh, people don't stand it and they bugger off somewhere else. And what they did was found America. Uh, obviously, the founding of America goes back a little earlier than that. But I think it's all part and parcel of the same thing. Like, uh, you know, the powers of Europe desperately trying to destroy the people. They, they tried to do it under the church, auspices of the church. They couldn't. They were, lo they were lobbied and violently opposed on, to some degree during the 17th century. So they had to create parliament. And now they control parliament. Um, I would be referring to monarchic rule um, specifically. Um, and now, it's like in the Yeats poem, isn't it? Church and state. The masses, or at least the majority of people, have been brainwashed into thinking the monarchy is benign and the state is empowered to help the people. The notion that the monarchy might still run the parliament to some degree, or at least underhand, we know that every politician who wants to go into war has to have the Queen's OK, right? So that's one measure of the fact that they're not as separate as people have been led to believe. But I would speak more about that um, in a talk, you know, entrenched in British um, history. But yeah, the 17th century is a great century to study. It's fascinating. And it's also Milton's era. It seems interesting to me that Milton, uh, Milton is... Um, on his last legs as the Central Bank of England is put in place. I think, if I'm getting my timelines correct. Uh, the progressive falsification of America has been going on for 80 years at least, and we have lived through half of it. I mean, as conscious leaders, we have had 40 years of ill-intentional and of semi-conscious semi -conscious befuddlement to contend with and it is time to come to the cumulative effect of that profit. We're on speech 11 now, which is titled Power, and subtitled The President Hath Power. When, Wil when Wilson further signed or tried to sign the United States name to a rascally agreement, he was not expressing the will of the nation. He had already wormed and wriggled out of the proper functions of his office. He had already wormed and wriggled knowing that he opposed the will of the people. He's referring to Wilson signing into law the Act, the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, I'm assuming. There, yeah, I think so. There is a limit or orbit to power. There is a limit or orbit to the practical effects of illegality. The error of old codface, Sawfoot, was his own, but he was abetted. In fact, he was butted, caressed, inoculated, and led down the garden path by his accomplices. They were warned, and even had they not been warned, it was their duty to ascertain what Woodrow's real powers were. The position of the Warburgs and Lloyd George at Versailles was that of crooks who accept a forged cheque in the hope of passing it on to someone else. And just by the by, I think Wilson, when he left office, admitted as much as Pound is saying that he was, uh, that he was manipulated. And I wouldn't be surprised if Lord George said the same thing, because these people just manipulate government, install a certain economic policy, and then get somebody else who, who will agree with them. And when the pe when they've gotten what they want, the other people are expendable. It's not as bad as it was in the Soviet Union, but it's a similar ethos, right?
He's referring, he's now going to talk about the League of Nations, which came out of the Treaty of Versailles. The League stank from the beginning. It stank of the Bank of Basel, the Warburgs, the Regents of the Bank de France, and the Ulcer of England. Not all Roosevelt's actions are infamous. As there is no criticism of music till you can judge the relative merits of different works by the same composer, so there is no political or ethical criticism till you can measure and judge the different political acts of the same political criminal, gangster or statesman. Speech 12. America was intentions. The Navy is, some of it, gone where I can't much help it. The Army can get on all right if it stays where it ought to be, namely on the North American continent. There is for South American countries. Our South American policy hasn't yet got as far as the Times. A Celt will soon be a re as rare in Ireland as a Red Indian on the shores of Manhattan. Prophetic statement. Is he referring to immigration or just because the economics of the country become utterly unviable for the native populace? It's an open question. Well, the moral behind any reference to John Davy, I think that's a misprint for John Dewey, is that Ireland kept hold of something. Call it the soul of the Irish nation. Kept hold of it through 700 years of oppression, bloody oppression, not tea party conversation. This war is part of a process that has been going on for some time and Roosevelt never lied with more typically Rooseveltian fluency than when he bleated out his sick blah about wanting to keep you, that is you, the American people, and your children and your grandchildren, out of war. A clean man would have been content to keep peace in his own time and trust his children to follow example. By continued bosh about Europe, which his mental and ethical level is much too low to reach, he tipped you into war with the Jew Asia, and you are most of you are most of you his accomplices. So he's saying the same powers exist in Asia and, and they're they're constructing the war. Wars are not won by sweatshops alone. They are not won by profiteers alone only. I mean the profiteers win profits, but they do not win wars. They start war, but they do not start them in order that any particular nation shall win them. I am making these rather gross allusions with a purpose. That is the faint wavering hope that something will wake you, that some phrase will penetrate the hypnotic or dope trance. These two men were distinctly not chosen by the people. Um, Who is he referring to there? Roosevelt, he's got three people actually, Knox, Stimson and Roosevelt, so I'm not sure who he's referring to here. These two men were distinctly not chosen by the people. No member of the Democratic Party would do particular dirts. Some of these decrepit hacks are chosen as imp instrument. That is okay from one point of view, point of view of tyranny. The overlord or autocrat must be served. If his own party will not follow him into certain messes, he must go outside his own party. Why not lay a wreath on the grave of the elective system? Here lies John Jones. He is not dead, but sleepeth. Or here lies democracy. By God, if I was dead, I think I'd admit it. There must, damn it, there must be traces of the American race left somewhere on the American continent. The race that set up the United States government. Have they lost all sense of coherence? Is American lucidity dead? It's also interesting is that um, we can't talk racially. We're not really culturally sanctioned anymore to talk racially, whether pro or con. It's all just marketed as hate speech, which is really interesting because up until the Second World War, lots of writers spoke about race and their assumptions were nuanced and, and often interesting. And they weren't all hate mongers, uh, supposedly wanting to kill people or to kill certain groups of people. 
I find that quite fascinating. Of course, Pound's use of race here is interesting. I mean, this is totally uh, unsanctioned. It's just uh, totally off the radar now. Um, you can't use that word without uh, being accused of some horrible misdeed. I think it's interesting because we've kind of hit a wall, haven't we? I mean, or at least we had, I think maybe we'd done that a few years ago. You know, the, the, the amount of stupidity. It's pretty fascinating. I mean, the amount of stupidity is so great that you can't even have a rational conversation, a learned conversation with the average person. Uh, is this the um, tail end of... Uh, oh, sorry. Um, is this is this the supposed tail end of the of any form of culture? I'm only speaking about Britain now. Uh, don't know for sure. Okay, let me hold on a sec. I'll get back to this. Um. Napoleon, speech 13. Not only do the main geographic features of our planet remain fairly stationary, but the nature of the soil and of the climate cannot be altered suddenly, even by the greediest politician or most ignorant man-hater and Knudsen Stakelevite. Some day the remnants of the American people will begin to wonder which side was right. They will wonder whether the choice was wise. They will even begin to wonder which side of what. Which side stood for which principle, not merely stood for which interest. Hank Wallace has shown up the interest. Gold. Nothing else uniting the three governments. England, Russia, United States of America. That is the interest. Gold, usury, debt, monopoly, class interest and possibly gross indifference and contempt for humanity. Now, if you know anything whatsoever of modern Europe and Asia, you know that Hitler stands for putting men over machines. If you don't know that, you know nothing. And beyond that, you either know or do not know that Stalin's regime considers humanity as nothing save raw material. Deliver so many carloads of human material at the consumption point. That is the logical result of materialism if you assert that men are dirt that humanity is merely material. That is where you come out. And the old Georgian train robber is perfectly logical. If all things are merely material, man is material, and the system of anti-man treats man as matter. Not my job to speculate on military conditions, but might be. My job, as I see it, is to save what's left of America and keep up some sort of civilization somewhere or other. I decline to abet the destroyers. I decline, so far as the light is conceded me, I decline to climb trees to catch fish. That's an old one, 2400 years old. Mencius referred to the folly of starting a war for something you couldn't get. Something the war could not bring to the monarch Mencius was talking to. So he said, climb trees to catch fish. It's interesting. Um, I was going to reflect something else on that. I'll leave it. Your school has been hooded. You have had a slow one put over you for 80 years moving imperceptibly, an inch here and an inch there, you have been euchred out of your history, out of knowledge of history, both American and world history. It cannot be done, said Henry Adams to Santayana. Referring to the philosopher George Santayana. Hmm... Why pick on the Jew? It's an interesting speech. Speech 14. 
I don't have any underlining, so I'm going to leave it. Not because because that, that's that's an interesting question, isn't it? It's kind of part of the worry of these speeches. Maybe I'll reread it and and reflect on it in some other talk that I want to give on pound. Fifteen gold, England. People that have been up against red Bolshevism, financed by Schiff in New York and Rothschild in London, see different. If you wait too long, you may see. So far, I have never met any English who believed in the abolition of personal ownership. I see you have lost the habit of Witten, the Wittenage mot, and the town meeting. If you don't grow or find a leader, you may have to wait for some kind-hearted Bavarian or Hungarian to come, f come free you from the Jews of New York. That's an interesting statement because I've spent some time in Hungary and I, I think it's a fascinating place and they have vaguely good leadership. Uh, I think we're still in the same speech. Gold. Can't let them print national money. All American money must be controlled by the debt and the debt controlled by the Rothschilds and their associated fellow Episcopalians. Gold bought from your Jewish merchants at a rigged price, that has ruined half the American people. Gold that is totally useless, save for false teeth and spectacle frames, not even in fashion for goggles, replaced by porcelain in swell dentistry. Mr. Wallace says you've got to go on blood and tears in till mankind bows down to the calf. How did you get there? He's relating it to worship, I guess, religious worship. And he does talk of that usuria, usura as a kind of a, a god, isn't it? Um, I think that's an interesting connection to make, actually. Mammon is more of the old phrase, uh, greed, etc. Speech 16, England. The enemy is Das Ley Capital. Your enemy is Das Ley Capital, international, wandering loan capital. Your enemy, enemy is not Germany. Your enemy is money on loan. And it would be better for you to be infected with typhus and dysentery and Bright's disease than to be infected with this blindness which prevents you from understanding how you are undermined, how you are ruined. As to your empire, it will not all of it won by clean fighting, but however you got it, you did for a time more or less justify keeping it, on the ground that you exported good government or better government than the natives would have had without England. You let in the Jew, and the Jew rotted your empire, and you yourselves outdued the Jew. Your allies in your victimised holdings are the bunya. You stand for nothing but usury and above metal usury. You have built up bank usury 60% against 30 and 40%, and by that you will not be saved. Corrupting the whole earth, you have lost yourselves to yourselves. He's speaking about England there. Damn it all, you slaughtered the flower of England in the Boer War, then in 1914 in the first three months. The best of you went out and got slaughtered. He starts talking about um, Siegfried Sassoon, I think. No Sassoon is an Englishman racially. No Rothschild is English. No Strakosch is English. No Roosevelt is English. No Baruch, Morgenthau, Cohen, Lehrman, Warburg, Kuhn, Kahn, Baruch, Schiff, Seif, or Solomon was ever yet born Anglo-Saxon. And it is for this filth that you fight. It is for this filth that you have murdered your empire. And it is this filth that elects your politicians. You have lost your tradition. You have not even learned what Lord Byron told you. You are, as, e as even that foul rag the Times tells you, a little late in making a start. In the year 1942, Anno Domini, there is only one start you can make, and that is a start toward being England, a refusal to be a province of Israel or an outpost of Yankee Judea. Mm. 
Lord Byron, the reference to Lord Byron is that uh, I think it's in Lord Harold's, what is it? Child Harold's Pilgrimage. He actually mentions the Rothschilds as, as agents of disaster or whatever. I, don't, I can't remember the quote. So the Romantics kind of knew a lot of this stuff, I think. And perhaps Byron more than others, because he was closer to government. He was basically an aristocrat. Um, speech 19. But how? Second item. There, gentle Britain, you have it. Your own heroes have told you. And your own true men, you have not heard not. You have not heard your own true speakers. You have lain down and died in the gutter because you would not hear your own friends, your own loyal speakers. You do not believe in the abolish, ab abolition of ownership. You do not believe that you should be ruled from abroad by Kuhn, Loeb and Warburg of the dregs of the ex-ghettos of Europe, now planted on the neck of the American people. Can you not see that the outrage of the bombardment of Paris is but one of a series of attempts to make real peace impossible and to pre prepare for the war after this one? Needless hate, sowing the seeds of hate for tomorrow. Does it mean nothing to you that in this war that you have inflicted more and worse wounds on your allies than on the people you said were your enemies? Can these things go on forever? without some glimmer of light reaching the British mind to show the real causes of the conflict, the real forces in conflict, usury against peasantry, usury against farmland, usury against every man who does a day's work, physical or with his mind. The only thing I do disagree with here, and I've discussed this with some people, is that, let's just read the first part again. He says, to prepare for the war after this one. And I think that's Im implicit in that is the, um, I should have memorized this, the name of this um, document before, but m many of you will know of it if you know about conspiracy theory. It's um, something that David Icke quotes. And again, he's been accused of being anti-Semitic for quoting this without real clarification of his own ideas. It's the... Um, it's the the foundation of the. I'll, I'll put the I'll put the name of the actual document in the, in the in the description. It's uh, the elders of Zion. It's the prediction of the elders of Zion that we have a Zionist movement which is Jewish and that it seeks to control uh, world populace through three through through three wars. Um, it, it's it's quite well known in conspiracy. Uh, I, I've studied that through David Icke and other people and I don't buy it to be honest um, Pound in this statement and in a few others in here I think does uh, and I think that's an error um, time will tell I don't put too much stock in it and I think this is so. This is why conspiracy theory is always skirting um, you know, um, anti-Semitism, because um, everybody is projecting complexes of power onto the world, and if you don't like the Jews, then you tend to project a complex of Jewish power. I would say the world is vastly more complex than that. Um, the embezzler sets up his papers, dailies and weeklies, that curse of God Wilkie was puffed up by the weeklies. The plague does not stop with the dailies. It sets up publishing houses. It grinds down all private liberty, economic. I mean, fewer and fewer men or groups have the money to run a paper. Every cranny is infested. Every college campus has a bookstore. Look to these bookstores. Look to the last vestiges of approximate freedom of the, pr of the press. Even the scholastic press that gets out small editions communicate, communicate, and communicate. A plot was outlined years ago to blot out classical scholarship, to blot out the historic sense. It went about on soft paws, making no noise. It was deadly.
You could get down to the usury swindles, lit up by Demosthenes. Will you wake up to the fact that, that the gradual elimination of the classics had a purpose, a damn dirty purpose? Get boiled down to a few harmless authors, say to Tibullus and Virgil, taste for the unreal in poetry, and the student's eye got off the reality. Look at John Adams' Pay Duma. Look at what a man in those days, with no million dollar library, could learn while living on American farmland, Boston having about 15,000 inhabitants. No, it is the habit of not being interested in taking things as seriously as that refers to a young American college graduate telling me his friends and acquaintances weren't interested in taking things as seriously as I do. That's kind of an interesting point. I, 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 take, I take the seriousness of Pound seriously <laughs> because, you know, he's kind of like a scholar. He's, he's a classical scholar with, a, with, a, with an eye locked on economics and on politics of the present, of his time. I have I have a complex feeling about that because I think perhaps there is room for laughter and comedy and I think things are worth laughing at. So this question of seriousness and comedy it's a, it's a complex one. Maybe I can put it in another talk because Joyce of course is is this guy who's punning and laughing and is just not very political at all. I think that's, I've mentioned it before, and it's a, always a bugbear of my talks and the way I present my arguments and presentations is that there does seem to be that appositorum between serious scholarly work and laughter and other form, modes of being. Um, I'm definitely not a serious pound. I don't know if my feelings are justified or not. Pound, at least at this point in his life, he looks at the at life as, and it's a philosophical precept that I'm trying to get at here. He looks at life as a kind of information war. You know, it's almost like the Alex Jones approach. I agree with that, but I also think that there are other things going on. Now, the Russian poets always used to have a large dollop of skepticism on the mystic angle on life because what it does is it means that you end up being a little kind of a, a boy or boy child or a naive child of the divine and you might wander off the political thread and I've noticed a few times in my reading of Russian poets that they're a little bit skeptical at, at, at minimum of that kind of approach I'm not saying my approach is that approach um, that's a complex issue and I, I might actually write an essay or do a separate talk on that this problem of um, mysticism and activism this this problem of how far can you project yourself into the divine whilst also being able to be serious enough to be responsible in everyday history insofar as you are living in time whether you like it or not Let's get a bit further ahead here. I'll do. An, I'll just do a few more chapters, a few more of these speeches, and then try to summarise. The illusion. Uh, sorry, where are we now? I've skipped for further ahead. Speech forty. He's. Uh, pontificating on E.E. E. Cummings who actually visited Russia and is very against was very against the Soviet regime and of course they, I think they are of the same generation Pound and Cummings so he's considering Cummings here the illusion of British gentleness was strong the prestige of Gladstone's humanitarianism was so great that many Europeans still rub their eyes and say can this evil be England and that amazement you have tried to exploit with your persisting lies about the feelings of Europe. No one attacked your free speech. You set up a Jew government in Germany and the Germans had to get rid of it or die. You behaved with crass injustice to Italy and the Italians woke up and reacted. 
until I hear from my best-tempered friend on a tennis court. Might have been while your ex-emperor was playing golf on the other side of the bushes, but I reckon it was a month or so later. Gli inglesi sono porci. Pigs. The English are porci, pigs, or the dog in the manger. I take it the Duce has been some rough stuff in his time, but I think one thing in his later life has surprised him, and that was the sheer selfishness and meanness of England. I'm not speaking officially. I haven't had anything to go by save I haven't had anything to go by save my own intuition and whatever evidence is open to anyone. Not one syllable has come out of England during the past two years or three years to show that England has one iota of consciousness that human beings can be other than English, that there are human beings in Europe endowed by nature with rights equal to those of sentient human beings. What has the trust or monopoly of your brains got to answer to that indictment? For God's sake, look at the parallels. Do I share that kind of contempt for England? I have done in the past. I don't know. Yes, I probably do most of it. Most of it. And D.H. Lawrence was loathed for being critical of his own country in the same way. Uh, just towards the end of this same speech. No, the next one. Speech 42. No, 43. One of your best Rome correspondents, war veteran and fervent patriot, said to me at time of sanctions, Abyssinian War, I have to be so very careful of every word. If I put in any phrase that they can possibly, they being his London office, that they can twist and use as a headline, they do it meaning to falsify what he sent him. This man did damn good work for England all through that period, very severe critic of things Italian, serving his country, but he could not get the true story printed, and when a book of his that had been welcomed and published in England and reviewed as the maximum of impartiality went out of print, and there was talk of a second edition, suddenly his publishers bunged it back at him. We don't want Italian propaganda talking about um, some uh, books of journalism which were pro pro Italy and kind of the fear that's in British the publishers in Britain which uh, hasn't gone away The Keys of Heaven, speech 45. Uh, he's going digging back into history here. The war of Biddle and his goddamn bank against the American people. A war won by the American people. Duce, Mr. Jackson, with Van Buren assisting. And that friendship is the second great friendship in our history. It's worth pointing out that, you know, that that's the other thing, is that he sees a link between Europe and North America even projected back into the past as um, a useful connection happening between uh, the Duce and the founders of America which is blasphemous to a lot of people nowadays I would imagine I see it as a, an interesting connection the problem with this is that it's hard to know and I, and I, I, can't, I can't say more than an interesting connection because I don't know enough about um, Mussolini, um, I know more about um, Jefferson and I'm a fan of the Constitution and wish we had something vaguely similar in England but don't imagine it's going to be coming anytime soon um, John Adams and Jefferson Jackson and Martin Van Buren and there have been Jefferson and his circle and the tradition of those men was the American heritage. And then come the Civil War and the assassination of Lincoln. And that war was said to be about slavery. And the American schoolboy's schoolbook says very little about the effects of debt. 
debts of the southern states to the bankers of New York City, and if Calhoun's name is still in the textbooks, his most significant words do not receive emphasis, not enough emphasis. And this will be interesting when I come round to give a talk on Walt Whitman, because Walt Whitman is not, did not figure that problem out at the time. And I, I do t take Pound's view of the American Civil War as being similarly an economic war, at least to a greater degree than has been perceived in our more sanctioned history recently. Both sides upholding an evil, South wanting to keep chattel slavery and the North wanting something cheaper than slavery, talking pious but knowing that is a great part of them, number of the worst of them sniggering that hired labour is cheaper than slave labour, and you don't really have to feed your employees, whereas if your stock is in slaves, you damn well got to feed them. Rothschild, John Sherman, Ikeheimer, Ike Ike Morton and Van der Gould, just put your mind on those dynasties, just remember those family names, which were not the names of the men who freed us from the shysters of London, Ikeheimer and Van der Gould and John Sherman and Rothschild. That's what Bismarck was referring to in his remarks about responsibility, and why did that war last so long? Well, you can all of you look into that question. It is discussable, it is highly discussable, but the outcome was the shooting of Lincoln and the end of publicity for Lincoln's idea, Lincoln's idea about money, which was holy verity and the health of the people, and gave to the people of this republic the greatest blessing they ever had, their own paper to pay their own debts. Speech 46, the British Imperium. Has anyone in England studied England's problem as Hitler studied the Germans' problem before and after the last war, not being led astray by analogies, but not blind to analogies. The analogy that most hits one in the eye now, if one is outside the uncharmed circle of your press, that is your smokescreen, is the analogy of England and of Austria as she was in her dying years. Speech 48, The Fallen Gentleman. Bolshevism, yes, Hank. The belief that non-Jews ought not to own property. As to Bolshevism, two things are established everywhere, save possibly in the dim mind of a Gunter or Thompson. First, that Bolshevism pretended to be an attack on capital, that it was financed by New York Jew millionaires, and that it, in effect attacked private ownership of land and of living space, which would be your kitchen and bathroom, as well as your farm or workshop. Again, there's the link between um, Jewish control and the control of capital. Um, so it's the belief that he's equated Bolshevism and Jewry as basically the same thing here. And that, I think that was a similar thing that Hitler did. Having read Mein Kampf, I'd have to go back to it. Um, I'm not sure. I think the control is more ideological than 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 of of one given racial group. Uh, that's just my intuition, and I'm quite happy to be daring and to, you know, sh shrug off all uh, potential attacks as being racist or hate mongering, but. But I just don't feel it in that connection. Like I feel that communism as an ideology um, is the thing that doesn't want you to own property. I'm not sure why it would be that the Jews would not want you to own property. Now there are people who argue for that. They'll go back to the pla pla places in the Talmud where this this is talked about. I won't comment on that because I've not read the Talmud, and I think one of the mistakes of um, people who get into, you know, conspiracy or diff different notions of economics is that, um, well, anything actually, it's a human problem. We have this strange ability to talk about things we don't know about. Um, so if there's evidence for specifically racial Jewish control 
of a person's property in the Talmud, then I'm not going to aff affirm that that's the case because I've not read it. And if I do, and if I change my mind, then you'll hear it first here. All capital is not, in our muddled world, the result of labour. John Citizen is not only mixed up about money, he is mixed up in his views about gold. Now gold is the product of labour. Apart from small beady particles, nuggets, nature offers man a natural mixture of quartz, heteroclite substances and gold in a crystalline or at least hard hodgepodge boule base in the sands of the Indies. And that gold chemistry is studied by students of inorganic chemistry. It is not rams and ewes, it is not amoebas, as Shakespeare definitely indicates. He points out that gold is not fecund, it does not increase and multiply as the sheep and goats of a herd. Plant it, and it does not come up in the spring, yielding twentyfold or thirtyfold or one hundred. This is an interesting question. I've actually discussed this, this, this economic question of gold with few other people. I, I have a good friend uh, in, in Korea who's interested in this topic and he made the same statement that the gold standard might be useful in the short term for making a correction on it, any given economy. This is my perspective. But that in the long term it's not natural in the same way that uh, what man is able to make with his hands is natural and so couldn't be that standard perpetually. But, you know, there's room for debate there. I'd love to see more debate on specific points of, of eco economics. Moral for good little boys. Mr. Franklin died honoured, and I believe fairly well off. Patterson died unhonoured and almost undiscovered. He's referring to the founder of the Bank of England, Patterson. I forget if it, his profit, was cast away on a desert island. Anyhow, he went bust. Yet Patterson got Europe pretty well muddled. You have three phases in what might be called the increase of muddlement. First, mankind's natural allergicity, his natural rebellion against belief that metal breeds, that so silver or copper or gold will grow if you plant it or shut it up in a box. Secondly, the perception that money, which represents something alive, vegetable or animal, may up to a point have the right to a peri periodical profit or interest if used in a way that helps to produce something useful, something enjoyable. Thirdly, you have the low-down Scotch trick of trying to collect that interest on money that represents nothing at all, money that is just flight of an airy fancy or the banks on human credulity, or on the known trustfulness and laziness of mankind. And that's what the shooting's about, Brother Henry. That's what the shooting's about today. Hmm, I'm not sure. I think the gold standard is a standard, and that might be worthwhile, at least in some manner or other. If it's not gold, then it's paper money given a value. Now, if the people running the Federal Reserve are responsible and they don't create debt, well, what can be done there could be a possible solution. Or you have another substance, gold, or you just can look at other substances that create that value. Again, it's just something manifested by the human mind communally. If it's agreed upon and... Uh, circulated responsibly then I don't know I don't see any issue with that the decline of New England no damn it the whole of the American people of the real United States stock isn't dead it's just lazy and muddled and jitterbug and things were so easy up there in the university levels by comparison I mean with the sub college levels and there is a defect with the non family system I mean people shifting around, people not passing on what they know inside their families. And then there is snobbism. That's another great barrier against learning. So we're at speech 49. I think I'm going to call it a halt soon. Speech 53. Aristocracies rot. They fall under usurocracy. 
That is their pathology. They're slopped down, their decadence, now in spite of lean years, and how I have always enjoyed a large share of privilege, got stocked up with university advantages, great deal of mental pleasure, always could bask in the best of what had been written and thought. That was nice for me, and it delayed my public utility for a decade. I had a nice time, but I contributed singularly little to curing the world's diseases. I don't suppose I worsened them any. Let me keep to the rich man's panic, the bourgeois panic. This panic starts when he begins not to know. Lord, it don't start as a clear perception. He begins to smell that capital comes from something that isn't an honest day's work. And he is scared out of his pantalettes at the idea of what it would mean to him if he had only what he could earn doing a workman's work, knowing he couldn't do it anyhow. I mean, I agree with all that. And the other thing that fascinates me about British culture is that we don't produce anything very much. I mean, we do produce things. We, 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 we have a small portion of the population doing that. But I'd say there's so much kind of investment, emotional and um, economic, in the institutions and in education and in government. I mean, I'd love to check this statistic out. It wouldn't surprise me if one in five people in the British population, even now, work for an institution or work for government of some kind. That's massive government. You know, the reason why Korea couldn't go into full lockdown? Because the amount of small businesses is massive. So that you can't lock everyone down, otherwise they'd be starving on the street. Government is smaller, and small businesses, the amount of people running small businesses is larger. Therefore, you have power within a populace, which means that you can actually stave off any lunatic theory that comes along through government quite easily, because they have a power within their culture, whereby people, you, could, you have to keep working, otherwise people starve. If you have a massive welfare system and, and massive government and loads of people working in government, you, you, you can be, you can be a, basically you're just so prone to any form of silly passing whim of a problem that uh, you can do things like shut down nations, stop people going outside. Otherwise you'd never be able to do it because there, be, there wouldn't be the money to do it, there wouldn't be magic money to do it. And, and, and I've already said in other talks that essentially it is a communist country. It's a communist country with a soft touch. But, you know, I've already made that statement in other talks. Your tragedy is that your able-bodied men were killed in the last war, pushed into war by the financier whose race is not uniformly 100% British. The men who ought to kick out your Walt Elliots, your Priestleys, were killed in the first three months of 1914, noticed it in Paris literary life in another way. No elders the young could respect. That is the way the alien race wormed into the system, kills off not only a government system, but the race itself. It has taken my generation, the whole of its time, 1910 to 1940, to discover the meaning. I mean, down to the bottom of the word corruption, social corruption, corruption of a race and of national order. The continent is a few decades ahead. France is in decay. The French have been studying the effect of Jews on France for over 50 years. Germans found out what it meant, reacted. Serious study of the Jew as problem. Again, this stuff is, I think, primarily addressed to England. No one despises your Wilberforces, but they have been dead for some time. Their modern equivalents are not on the BBC, nor are they respected in England to the point of giving them any power. That is your sorrow or somnolence. You have heard that they are a forgery or a plagiarism, and you haven't stopped to ask what they are a forgery or plagiarism of. God, no, they are not pleasant reading. They are heavy no style, very dull, but do you know what is in him? Have you looked at Lord Sydenham's preface? Naturally not, that is, very few of you have, 
And so when Lasky starts being clever, you do not see what he is aiming at. You fail to detect the point of his aim, which of course he will deny. I mean, he will swear blue, green or pink that his aim is other. But watch him. Uh, I'm just, I haven't underlined this bit, but I just see that there is some mention of the protocol. It's called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. I got the title wrong earlier. Now, say I am coherent. Say I have not given you a formal discourse. Let us be clear. You compare Lasky's total program with the total program of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion without going into the sources of that document. Compare the two programs and then come back and tell Papa. Oh, you want to know what I'm talking about? Well, it is this. You get a couple of nice cultured old gentlemen and they have lived in Oxford and dined and breakfasted in the shades and they have read the so-called classics without much curiosity and they have not burrowed into the dirt of history apart possibly from a few porky bits of Latin pornography and they are innocent as babes just born of the bearing of certain phenomena such, for example, as the getting rid of Latin studies or the lowering of interest rate while increasing the total burden of interest to be paid. He's attacking the, the kind of the elder generation of that era. And I think that's I mean there's a whole other there could be a whole other question on what, what is Pound's mindset when it comes to the protocols of the elders of Zion. I'd love to have it like a proper debate even with somebody about this issue. Whether it is I mean what what is the nature of it? Um I mean, how do we deal with that document? Um, I think I'd love to uh, debate it with somebody who was Jewish or who was from other groups of people just to kind of get all kinds of thoughts going on, on it and whether it's justified or not. Or, I mean, the problem with ra speaking racially is that, um, and speaking in terms of group identity, is that evil connect, collects up, you know, in each race, I guess. Um, the thing is not to make generalizations, at least from my perspective. I mean, for a while I did um, consider, you know, this bigger question, racial question, and think, possibly convince myself for a number of days or weeks that it was purely um, the racial side of things. But I don't, I don't think I'm, I'm of that mind. I just have a question about this uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Darkness, speech 55. Given a little more knowledge, given the elimination of a small number of shysters, the war need not have happened. Well, Europeans who ought to have known more than American farm boys got toppled into it because they were ignorant. Books may sell 15 editions in 40 years without penetrating the mind of a nation. Some things that I say are not new but I believe they are all necessary to know in which way the wind blows. You have got to learn some things or die. Got to learn some things or perish. And I, I definitely agree with that. I think this is a vital thing. People, people have not figured out that study is necessary in order to make your life easier. And they will go on suffering and suffering. I'm not saying I'm exempt from it either. Okay, last but not least. Speech 84, May 9th, 1943. If Germany has been in the hands of the yellow-livered cheats and escrows of your pawnbroker's government, what would Germany have done? She would have yelled bloody murder for Japan to come halop her and attack Russia from the east. That is what England would have done under similar circumstances and the Axis published agreements are such as to have made the arrangements quite possible. And if the British socialists were anti-capitalists, they would have been attacking loan capital in England for the past 20 or more years. And if the British communists were real communists instead of the left hand of loan capital, they would have been attacking the capitalism of England, the USA, the Jew capital, or the sub-Jew or yellow British capital, in the interests of world revolution instead of standing out. So you are allied with your enemies. I don't say all men of principle are in jail, 
but that is what those who are in jail are in for, for trying to save you. Will you ever realize that the mere continuance of the war is a victory for loan capital, a victory for the lenders of money, or for the money monopolist, the controller of monetary issue? Usually, foreign controller, or at least private, not public controller. Great debt to be made from war. That was the American Civil War to be used to control the currency. Okay, I think you've got a general sense of the speeches. Um, it's a shame that we don't have them in a decipherable form on the internet. Uh, recording standards being what they were, or um, broadcast standards. So, what do I make of the speeches overall? I think anybody who studies pounds should read them, that's for sure. I think they should read them because they would learn more about Pound's times and about the Second World War. Pound stayed faithful to fascism to the end, I think, to some degree. Um, and I, I've met people in Italy who, who are, you know, still um, fascists of some stripe or other. Uh, I'm not necessarily in agreement with them. But, um, yes, if you want to understand the politics of the time and you want to understand... Pound's mindset, particularly from, say, the mid-30s through till the end of his life, or at least till the mid-60s. He didn't comment politically that much uh, as he got older. I think he was tired of the, the question, the economic question, to be quite honest. And I've, I don't know if I've written an essay or planned to write an essay called Pound's Silence. I think Pound's silence of the 60s, because he had actually gave up talking for a long while, was some of that was to do with them. Um, to utter disenchantment with um, post Second World War situation, and uh, nobody had heeded the the economic advice that he'd given. And I think even if you're wanting to discuss all of this stuff, there are ways in which you can kind of say, okay, you know, I'm not <laughs> I'm a convinced fascist, obviously, but what are the questions? What are the topics that he's raising with this issue? Is this an issue for the Bank of England in England right now? What is it? What does it do? We know that its function is to lend money, essentially. We know that the last 50 years, debt has increased exponentially, right? So we're not in a very good situation economically. Um, this has always been lumped in with just conspiracy theory, but it's its, its own form of study, and there's not enough um, conversations about the way money functions. See, I'm, I seem fairly convinced in my mind that usury, money lending at interest, is a total nightmare and destroys nations as, as Pound predicted it would do. And he looked at his, his own history and America's history of the 19th century with those problems in mind. And it's kind of like this sense of the secret cause for a lot of political and social problems. I mean... The founding of America purely could be based on this one issue. So I, I would say that that is something that we need to study. I mean, you, you should be studying this stuff at school. I think possibly the reason why we, why Americans have a constitution, it being good or bad, is that it was necessary as protection against possible introduction of forms of economy that would destroy the well-being of the people. We don't have that in England. I, I remember it, I was never that interested in history at school, but the one thing I can say is that I had a good history teacher. And I still believe what he said when he said that uh, America has um, a, a useful, basically good form of governments there, and England does not. So England can't really defend itself against a lot of, a lot of this stuff because we have no government policy that's willing to address the problems of central banking. Maybe if you were feeling optimistic, you might say after Brexit, perhaps there'll be more protectionism. We could have a debate on what is the Bank of England, who is running it, and uh, can we make sure we have some standards when it comes to the distribution of money and the ways in which we, we perceive the economy of our country. Um, 
it, it's 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 probably complicated now by because this is an old debate. I'm not. I don't want to give you the impression that I'm not talking. There are other forms of currency now, right? We've got Bitcoin and we've got other forms being promoted. Um, I think that's all well and good, but um, you would have to imagine a time when the government had the guts to 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 take a good look at all of this stuff. I mean, if you've got a country that's in debt, you know, for trillions of pounds, um, which is pretty much going to be the consequence of um, the lockdown, this question is going to have to come up. And if it doesn't, I don't think there'll be much of a way out of this problem because everybody's in debt perpetually. Um, it could be that with certain reforms that happen in America post Brexit, maybe there will be, you know, this kind of discussion that will come out of it. Um, so that's kind of my summary on that one. If you're interested in economics, if you're interested on Ezra Pound's politics and why he held those political beliefs, if you're interested in basic economics, as opposed to economics espoused by education, generally speaking in the West, then you owe it to yourself to read Pound's um, speeches as they manifest in this book, which is called, again, Ezra Pound Speaking. I'm hoping very much there's a downloadable version of it, otherwise I'll try to find some form of it that you can find if you want to read um, his his book, or what, what has become his book. Um, beyond that, you can also plug in Ezra Pound Radio, into YouTube. Um, I think now we have people reading. I've just given you a, a short selection of stuff, but I think now we actually have. Um, there was one person dedicating themselves to reading each speech of Ezra Pounds. Um, I don't know if that project's completed, but at least a year ago I knew that that project was ongoing, so you could check that out. I think it's called Ezra Pound Radio. Um, and if you don't know much about Ezra Pound, this side of Ezra Pound, then I think that YouTube will assist you because there's lots of more stuff come up um, on this topic in the last few years. The other way of searching would be um, Eustace Mullins, E-U-S-T-A-C-E. -E. Eustace Mullins was a friend of Pound's and Pound commissioned him to study the Federal Reserve. So Eustace Mullins has a lot to say about this topic as well. In fact, Although both of them are not really, um, they're really kind of heretical writers in the Western world and they're kind of confined to the internet, at least on this topic. Um, Secrets of the Federal Reserve is commissioned by Ezra Pound, but it's by uh, Eustace Mullins. So I'd recommend that if you can get your hands on it and I will link to it in the description if I can find it. Okie dokie, thanks very much, have a good one, bye.